Hi, it's Anthony Romero, the National Director of the ACLU. I want to thank you all for joining us for this town hall. It is our first town hall since inauguration. And I don't know about you, but I feel, <laughs> I feel an incredible sigh of relief that has continued these weeks since inauguration. It's also great to be together in company and to be huddled around the campfire in a virtual kind of town hall with ACLU members. And because it is time for us to come together and it is time for us to remark on what we've been through together as a country, as an organization, as individuals, as citizens. And I just wanna say how incredibly thankful and proud I am of the work we've done and thankful for the support you've given us. They have been four long years with Donald Trump as president. And in his tenure, we filed all in 413 legal actions. The last one, the week before he left the Oval Office, we fought the good fight and making sure that we brought everything we could to bear to stand up for civil liberties and civil rights. And we could, not, we could never have done that work uh, without your support, without your activism, without your engagement, without your belief that we the people met, had to mean all of us. And so I just wanna take a moment and say thank you. And we're not done. So this part of the purpose of today's call is to make sure that we know what the agenda is. We have a lot of work to do in the States where the battle for civil liberties and civil rights still rages on, especially in some of these States that are kind of ground zero for, for our most important set of issues. We have a, a lot of cleanup to do uh, Donald Trump and his administration have left a toxic waste dump uh, behind in terms of civil liberties and civil rights. It's going to take us years, if not decades, to fully dig out, but we are resolved and we are capable of doing the, the important work. And I think that also the events, especially at the very end of the Trump administration with the insurrection on the Capitol on January 6th, we have really borne witness in a way that we knew all along, but it was America has now fully finally seen the level and the extent to which white supremacy and prejudice has kind of seeped into the, you know, the very foundations of our nation and how, you know, Donald Trump and his administration, his policies has appealed to the worst of our demons. And Rather than lament uh, a very challenging dynamic which was unleashed, we should kind of look at it with steely eyes, with clear resolve, that that is the work that is before us. And that's what today's conversation is all about, to talk to you about what the ACLU is going to do to double down on our systemic equality agenda, to make sure and to make real the promise that the founders made that we are all created equal and that we're all given the right to live free from discrimination and the right to live with dignity. So with your help, with your partnership, with your resolve, with uh, our collective energy, failure is not an option. So I just wanna thank you also very, very much. If you're not a people power volunteer activist yet, you gotta sign up right after this uh, town hall and we will put you to work. I wanna talk to you about how we're gonna structure today's meeting. We're gonna talk to you first about what's possible under the administration of President Biden and Vice President Harris. Love uh, saying their two names. Uh, second, I wanna to talk to you about our kind of multi-pronged ambitious plan to address uh, the racial injustice that is too much a part of the lives of, of millions of Americans and to what we call our agenda for systemic equality. And then third, I wanna cover about how you all uh, can help and how you all can be protagonists. This is uh, not a program that you watch, right? Democracy. This is actually a program that you have to engage in. So let me then just uh, turn over now and, and, and introduce you to, uh, we also have a special message for you from a very special guest at the very end. They wanted me to make sure I mentioned that to you so that you stuck around and don't, don't uh, hit the pause button on, the, on this video broadcast. But let me introduce you to Ronald Newman, the National Political Director of the ACLU. Ronnie, good to see you. It's good to see you, Anthony. I didn't wear a jacket, but you obviously did. So you get, the, you get two points. Thank you for doing so. So in the 
respect to our, our colleagues and folks at home. But tell, tell folks a little bit about how long you've been here and the role you play at the ACLU, just so they know exactly who, who you are and the work you do for us. Oh, absolutely. And first, I'll just note that it is a real joy to be a part of this conversation as we are turning the page on a pretty dark period in our country. As we think about the steps forward, I'm really excited. And this conversation will give us an opportunity to talk about why I am so excited. Uh, as Anthony noted, I'm national political director here at the ACLU. And I've been on Team ACLU for four years now, working hard to protect civil liberties and civil rights. And now we're gonna see if we can advance them a bit in these next few years. All right, so talk to me. I mean, I've been watching and tracking with you every day these, I don't know, four dozen or so executive orders or proclamations that have come out fast and furious, right? It's another reference to another time, another president, but it's been remarkable to see how the Biden administration really has jumped on uh, from, the, from, from, the, from the moment go on how they've tried to address it. Walk us through a little bit about what has happened in the immigrants' rights context and the LGBT context. You know, give us a sense of the waterfront of what's happened over the last mm, about three weeks, almost a month yeah, uh, in terms of executive actions. Absolutely. So one of the unique things about our system is that the president, the office of the president has a, a great deal of authority to take policy action, including on issues that we care about, issues in the civil rights and civil liberty space. And we've seen the Biden administration get off to a pretty good start. Day one, Team Biden rescinded the Muslim ban. That was a big win. We as an institution obviously have a special relationship with that <laughs> issue. And so we celebrated quite a bit on that first day. Is our first legal action that we filed on the Muslim ban. That Absolutely. was on, I guess he signed it on January 27th and we were in court on January 28th. Mm -hmm. It was a snowy night in Brooklyn when we got the first nationwide stay. I remember that I was there. So yeah. go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Not a problem just, at all. We saw it from beginning to end, but end. that's only one piece that's been taken thus far. We also lived through years of construction of an odious border wall down on yeah. our southern border. You know, President yeah. Trump built more than 450 miles of wall during that four year period. The Biden administration has also announced a halt to further construction. That's another win for civil liberties. Mm -hmm. We've also seen action on DACA. We had dreamers all over the country living in fear for years during this past administration through administrative action, that program has been resolved. And, and it's been preserved. If, if you move from immigration and you start to think about LGBT yeah, rights, LGBT rights, right? You've seen the trans military ban eliminated. It's one of the Another, cases that we brought that we ended up losing. And in fact, it was one of the few cases that we lost in the Trump administration. Our absolutely. lawyers, Joshua Block and Chase Strangio, brought the, that great case and gave it a great fight. But absolutely. finally, it was reversed, right? So we've seen that be reversed. And we also had a huge win, obviously on LGBT rights issues in the Bostock case yep. to try to beat back discrimination in the workplace and in other areas. And so what we have now is a bit of a trend line that we hopefully will continue to be able to build on. So you've seen those types of actions, not only in the immigrant, immigrants' rights space, but also in the LGBT rights space thus far. All of that is positive, but there's much, much more to do. Yeah. So before we go into what else uh, is there to do, I think, I mean, the one thing I would punctuate is that these issues that you just outlined, whether it's the border wall or whether it's um, the family separation, which you want to come to, or the census issue around immigrants or employment rights for LGBT folks, uh, those were all lawsuits and cases that the ACLU fought. And in most cases, won. And I think one of the things I would remark upon in the last four years, because you have to draw the lessons out, is that that litigation and the advocacy that we that we undertook did help preserve the status quo. Mm -hmm. And while there were places that there were real setbacks, um, there were places that we were able to hold the line. Talk to me about family separation. You know, this is the issue that I have been also deeply involved with and connected to from the beginning. But walk us through a little bit about the executive order around the uh, family separation and how are you seeing kind of the other issues around 
immigrants' rights. You, you know this issue very well. Before you came to the ACLU, I will say to the audience, Ronnie used to work in the White House on immigrants and refugees issues. And so it was one of the phone calls I got when oh, President Obama left the White House saying, you must hire Ronald Newman, he's fantastic. And his expertise on refugee and immigrants' rights was something we really wanted to, to, to fill out on the team. But walk us through how you see the family separation issue. Yeah, so family separation, like the Muslim ban, is an issue where we as an institution very much have a special relationship. Uh, yeah. We have fought strenuously on the issue of family separation. And we will continue to fight strenuously on that issue because there is action that the US government needs to take that we have not seen quite yet. Um, we obviously had the Biden administration announce a task force would yeah. be assembled to look into these issues. Yeah. But we as an institution have very particular ideas for how to put that dark chapter behind us. And yeah. so we have communicated uh, our request to the administration, we will be, we will be engaging them uh, repeatedly and putting pressure on them to really make amends for that horrific chapter in our history. And so if you wanna know the specifics of what we've asked for, an example is we think that families that were harmed through the family separation program should be reunited in the United States in if the they US, so right? choose. Mm -hmm. So if a child's parent was deported back to Guatemala or to Honduras and they would like to come to the United States to be with their child, the Biden administration should make that possible and give them, confer upon them a legal status that gives them some security and stability. On top of that, we have asked for the Biden administration to provide trauma counseling after you've been through an ordeal like family separation yeah it leaves yeah. scars. And we yeah. as a country have a responsibility to help try to heal those wounds and address those scars. We've so also- So this is a place yeah. where we're likely, I'm sorry to interrupt you, no, but no, you no know, I'm irrepressible on this issue. I can't help myself even as I try. But, you know, on family separation, I think President Biden and uh, I think the first lady Biden is also on the task force. And I think the task force is chaired by whom? By Ali Mayorkas, uh, Secretary Mayorkas? So you have leadership at the Department of Homeland Security, also Tony Blinken at the Secretary of State. Okay. And a handful Which is of great. Yeah. But they haven't made the commitment that you just made, right? Mm -hmm. To reunite the families here, right? They'll talk about reuniting and finding, and finding the 600 or so family members that are still separated from their kids. But that ain't good enough, frankly. For us, we want to make sure that they are reunited and brought allowed to stay here. And that if you think about what happened with family separation, an official policy that separated kids from their parents and deportation proceedings, uh, authorized at the highest levels with Jeff Session and with Secretary Nielsen, that it ain't good enough to just say, oh, we're gonna find, connect them back and then send them off on their no. merry way. It is, and, about, it is about demonstrating to these people the type of country we really are. They got exactly. an image of us that is not the United States of America. And by embracing them and bringing them in, we can actually make clear who we are as a people. I think it's a, it, I think family separation will go down as one of the greatest stains in what the criminal policies of our government, just like the turning back of the St. Louis during the Second World War, or just like uh, Japanese American internment. And on Japanese American internment was the ACLU case. We brought that case in 41, lost it in 44. And we fought for reparations for the Japanese-American internees who were interned. Uh, and it and got that under President Reagan. So it's the same type of reparations restitution framework that we brought to Japanese-American internment will bring to family separation. Talk to me about impeachment, because everyone's talk, talking about impeachment. It's the week of impeachment. What's going on about accountability with this president? Yeah, so this is obviously a time in which Former President Donald Trump has been is being put on trial in the Senate for his attacks on our democratic system that tragically led to the events of January 6th. And so that process is playing itself out in the Senate. The politics of the Senate are what they are. And so it is an open question whether he will actually be convicted. We hope so because we think it's merited, but it's unclear. One thing that we've decided to do as an institution is push down other channels to also seek accountability for the series of actions that started in advance of the election and ran all the way through January 6. We've asked the Department of Justice to appoint a special counsel to right. investigate to see if civil rights crimes were committed. We've asked the House of Representatives to investigate whether members of Congress 
were involved directly in the events of January 6. We also plan to do electoral work down the road because voters ought to know and ought to be reminded which elected officials stood on principle at a key moment like this and which ones didn't. All of that is part of how we as an institution ensure one way or another that there is accountability uh, for the attacks on our democracy. And then just to really wrap it up and then cue it up with our next speaker, the, the work that we're asking for, the demands we just sent to the letter that you and I worked on, we just sent to President Biden outlining our systemic equality agenda, which really flows from four years of living with Donald Trump, but also punctuated with the events of January 6th. Talk to me a little bit about the, the, what it is that we asked for in that letter for racial uh, equality, the systemic equality letter we just wrote to President Biden. Absolutely. So this recent period we've gone through as a country, tracing back to the tragic events of George Floyd and all the way through recent events around the, le uh, the election have, have, have cast a, a spotlight on the enduring challenge we face on issues related to systemic racism. And we as an institution are making our lodestar, our principal primary campaign effort, taking action to get at that issue of racial equity racial equality. And so we've been in the laboratory developing ideas and refining ideas for a couple of months now. And so now we are rolling out what we are calling the systemic equality campaign. You will hear from our president, Deborah Archer, my colleagues, Renika and Rakim, and they will delve into the details of what we will do during this campaign. But at core, this is about empowering communities of color, closing the racial wealth gap, and, and finally addressing in a holistic sense the dark stain that slavery and Jim Crow and discrimination and racism have cast on this country for hundreds of years. That's what systemic equality is about. And I could not be more excited about yeah. that work. Okay, dear man. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for thank you for the time. Thank you for wearing a jacket. Thank you for your thought and your energy, your dynamism. Deborah Archer. Hello. Lovely to see you as I transition from Ronnie. Goodbye, Ronnie. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Deborah Archer the national president of the ACLU. You were just selected president. You are the what? The eighth? The eighth. The eighth president in our 101 years. And I am utterly thrilled. Tell our folks on the, the ACLU family around this virtual campfire, just a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and how long you've been on the job now. It's been what, four days? <laughs> no, seven. All right, all right. So give them a sense about who you are and why. Tell, let, them, let them see why I am so excited to be working cheek by jowl with you. So I'm really excited to be in this role. As you know, Anthony, the ACLU has been an important part of my life, my professional life, for over two decades. And I grew up in Connecticut and unfortunately experienced a lot of discrimination because my parents were immigrants, because they didn't have the opportunity to go to college because of our economic status and because of the color of our skin. And I decided very early on that I wanted to become a civil rights lawyer so that I could fight for the rights of families like mine to live with dignity and respect. And I was really proud and lucky to start my legal career as a Carpacken Fellow with the ACLU. And then after my fellowship, I continued to fight for civil rights and racial justice at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, an organization yeah. that, um, as you know, has been critical in, tra in training leaders in the fight for racial justice. It is, it is the most important flagship institution in the entire country when it comes to racial justice and civil rights. And what the LDF has done under Cheryl and Eiffel and before her with John Payton and Elaine Jones and Julius LeBon Chambers really has been to serve as a seedbed of leadership uh, at, at so many organizations beyond their own. I mean, so many of our greatest leaders like you come out of the LDF, and so it's it's great. And so you were first at the ACLU, then at the LDF, and then, and, and and then now, where did you go and end up? Now I'm at NYU Law School. And throughout right. that time, I've always welcomed every opportunity to support the ACLU. So having this opportunity now to serve and to work with you and support the work um, as president is a real joy. It's wonderful. Let me, let me ask you about the board, because I was just talking with Ronnie, I think you were probably hearing on the, in the wings of this mm -hmm. virtual town hall about the board's um, decision 
to vote, I think for the third time in our 101 year history to impeach a president, the first time with Nixon and twice with Trump. So can you talk a little bit about the role of the board and you know, the deliberative process by which you were a part of that kind of second decision that, and also the first one, because you were there also for the, not Nixon, yeah. uh, but the first Trump impeachment. But walk, talk us through a little bit about the role of the board. Yeah, I, I, as uh, I think you ha have mentioned, it, it is not something we do often, it's not something that we did lightly. Um, it, there was a lot of debate and discussion about um, this moment in time, the importance of this action, the threats to civil rights and civil liberties uh, that Donald Trump proposed, and whether or not the ACLU should stand up and speak out against that in the same way that we filed all of those lawsuits to stand up and use our resources to defend uh, civil rights and civil liberties under four years of attack. And so we thought it was important to have our voices heard to speak up to defend the Constitution. Yeah. And then talk to me now as we pivot, you and I pivot together, right? Um, we always joke privately, we can share the joke that one of us rides the motorcycle, the other one rides the sidecar and we take turns when one of us gets tired of driving. So sometimes I'm in the sidecar and sometimes um, I get behind the handlebars. But as we think about systemic equality agenda, when we're driving this agenda for the ACLU, help folks understand what, you know, the, how we're thinking about it, the why, the why now, the, the how, you know, just the broad contours from, you know, the highest levels of our organization, you with being the ACLU president, the first, you know, black person to helm this organization in 101 years. Talk to us about the importance of that, uh, of our agenda that marries the moment. Yeah. Uh, for a long time, racial justice advocates have been calling for a third and final reconstruction to add, to kind of address historic and systemic racism and equality to create really radically different legal frameworks that center human dignity as central to any racial justice agenda. And that finally and meaningfully address how race, class and place intersect to shape people's lives. And I think the events of the past year have made it painfully clear that we cannot wait any longer before taking bold actions to move us forward. And I think the systemic equality agenda is really a powerful move forward. Um, so to talk a little bit about the pieces. Yeah, yeah. The systemic equality agenda is a comprehensive racial justice agenda that has the goal of eradicating the vestiges of colonialization, slavery, um, and Jim Crow, identifying and challenging the modern tools of racial inequality, and really prioritizing political, social, and economic equality. Um, and as you said, like the ACLU covering the waterfront of issues, the systemic equality agenda really does cover front, cover the waterfront of issues. Yeah. And like the challenges that are facing black communities and other communities of color, the work is and will be intersectional. It's gonna include protecting and expanding the right to vote, challenging racial segregation and advancing the right to fair housing, um, student loan debt cancellation, yeah. and working on a range of economic justice issues, including expanding access to financial services. So let me ask you a question there, because I always get this question. So I want to see, I want to come up with a better answer. But when, whenever folks begin to see us do work around economic justice, they say, well, why is that a civil liberties issue? And when we talk about closing the racial wealth gap, why, and we're not talking just about freedom of speech or freedom from discrimination, but we're actually talking about the economic conditions of many black and, and brown and communities of color. Why is that a civil liberties issue that should be a concern to the ACLU? I, I think it's, it's essential to, to safeguarding equality in the 21st century for people to have access to, to basic services, to have access to basic financial services, to be able to provide for their families and themselves, and to be able to live lives with dignity uh, and lives of uh, choiceful lives and without access to economic resources, economic opportunity, that really isn't possible. I think your economic situation impacts your ability to take advantage of fully to enjoy the rights that we have under the constitution. I, I totally agree. I and mean, what I keep saying is that, you know, freedom of speech is a hard right to kind of exercise if you don't have a job or you don't have food in your belly. That's right. And I think, you know, I know that we've talked on the board and I've talked with you privately just on how connected these rights are. 
Let me, let me, uh, I've also wanted to get your thoughts on how do you see this in the context of law, of our overall work around racial justice? Is this a brand new departure? I'll opine. I obviously have an opinion about this too, but get, help, help set the context for how this is kind of the next iteration of a longstanding commitment to it. I think that racial justice has been core to our work since our founding. And as yeah. you mentioned, we often say that uh, we're fighting for to make sure that we the people means everyone. And if we are serious about equality, if we are serious about making sure that we the people means everyone, racial justice work really has to be at the core of the work that we that we do. Um, and yeah. so much of what we do already is truly racial justice work. And now we're just redoubling those efforts and, and, and our focus and applying more resources to this. Yeah, I, I would I also add, which you, you know very well, is in 1931, I mean, really, we, I think the ACLU issued its very first re report called Black Justice. Um, some of the earliest cases we took in the 1930s also with the Scottsboro Boys, a case where young black men were being accused unlawful. Um, uh, uh, unlawfully of, of a rape of two women. And over the years from Loving versus Virginia, I think my favorite case, so beautifully kind of named, you know, for Mildred Loving, but it was all about love and her being able to marry her white husband. And then over the years, the driving while black and brown work. And so what we're doing now is kind of really leaning in with a level of intentionality across our respective kind of programs, across our geographies, because you come from the New York affiliate, but you were also at, at the national uh, uh, board. You were also the affirmative action officer for all of our affiliates as they were. So say a last word about how you see this play out in states where, um, where the racial justice issue is so significant. Yeah, I think it's important that a lot of this work is going to be driven by our affiliates who are on the front lines um, at ground zero. I think it's also important that in order to see the deep and meaningful change that we hope to see through our systemic equality agenda, we know that it's just, it's not just about what work we do, but how we do it. So we're going to be targeting resources where they're needed the most, including a significant investment and dedicated resources in the South. And we also know that the success of any of our efforts to advance racial justice and equity will be limited unless the individuals and communities who are most at risk of harm are central to designing and implementing our efforts. So we're gonna really work closely and in coalition with and led by members of impacted communities who have been doing this work on the ground for decades all around the country. Right. Well, I wanna thank you for the time, Deborah, and I really appreciate um, the the vision and the leadership and the gravitas you bring to this issue. We're really lucky to have you. So to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. So to pivot now to the question around affiliates, let me call to the stage, this virtual stage. Let me call to the stage. And Andrea Young, are you there? I'm here. All right. The ACU director of Georgia. Yes. Sophia, are you there? Sophia Lynn Lacken, who is the deputy director of our uh, voting rights project. Lovely to see the two of you. It seems like a perfect segue. We were just talking about, I'm not sure if you heard Deborah, um, Andrea, we were just talking about the important work of the affiliates. Yeah. So talk to me about Georgia, right? <laughs> uh, everyone's favorite state. If I could, if I could go anywhere right now outside of this dining room that I've been in for the last 11 months, Right. I'd probably want to go to Georgia because of, you know, just what you all have been able to accomplish down there. But talk to us a little bit about what you see as a landscape well, on, in Georgia. Yeah. And then I want to pivot to yeah. you and Sophia talking a little bit about the voting rights issues in particular. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're excited uh, in Georgia. We're also already facing backlash, which is the story of uh, progress on uh, civil rights and racial justice. Uh, so we're, we're very excited. We, you know, I've been in this job, uh, like Ronnie, uh, just over four years. I came in talking about, you know, we're going to fight gerrymandering. We're going to fight for voting rights. We're going to make sure that whatever policy, that, that people who are impacted by policies in Georgia are going to have their voices heard. Uh, of course, we know Stacey Abrams came up with a brilliant analysis, yeah. uh, you know, of the issues of concern to African-American voters and 
Uh, and so we've been working just relentlessly on every aspect of uh, voter suppression. We worked on voter access. Uh, we worked, So the stadiums that you saw in use on voter election day, we actually pioneered that in Georgia, uh, yeah. where our, 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 our stadium was, was used um, for voting. And so in 2018, we had a lot of absentee ballots rejected. Yes, and that's we, right, that's right. we brought a lawsuit to stop that from happening in 2018, but also to set up a procedure. And then we went into the legislature and really carved out a procedure for how ballots, absentee ballots would be handled. Uh, and so- And this is when? This when exactly was, is This it? was in uh, 2019. So pre-COVID. So Pre-COVID. Uh, God you know, bless just you. Say, you know, before people really, uh, you know, again, our thing is every vote, you know, every voter, every citizen, every vote right. counts. It should be easy. People should vote the way that they want. And and so by keeping that percentage of voting of absentee ballot rejections down, when 1.3 million people showed up to vote by mail in yeah. COVID, yeah. those votes were counted. <laughs> You know, yeah. and the president called and said, hey, you know, Brad, can you find me? Can you find me? Can you find some of these votes? Right? And that, you know, and that yeah. is, you know, what about those Fulton County? And we had, um, yeah, yeah. you know, and so we really, we really have been very attentive to the mechanics because it was, it's a game of inches in Georgia. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, to make sure that black votes, especially, uh, are counted in our state. Yeah. So one of the things, Sophia, to pivot to for now, for now. So one of the things that I think we're seeing is that obviously, with some of members of the of the body politic, mostly Republicans, being unhappy with what played out in Georgia and what happened with the presidential election, they're now doubling down on an effort to purge people from the polls. But the Brennan Center was saying that they have a hundred. They've tracked 106 bills in 28 states that would restrict access. Is that true? <laughs> Is that you're seeing that and more, Sophia? Talk, talk to us about the backlash you're seeing across the country. Yeah, so it's unfortunately, you know, just as in Georgia, we're seeing um, an immediate and very, very significant backlash against the really wonderful participation that we saw in this last election and the, uh, the runoff election as well. We're seeing that happen across the country and um, these 106 bills that you mentioned, yes, yeah. we are seeing that. And that is triple the number that we saw at this point in time last year. So just to give a sense of the really, really size of the response to uh, what occurred in November. And what are we doing and what can we do about these efforts to kind of impose these restrictions, walk them through. I know that that's what you do day and night, right? Even when you're sleeping, I'm sure you're working on a brief, but what gives people a little bit of, an in, uh, of a window into what it means to be the deputy director of the Voting Rights Project. I mean, you, your folks, if I remember correctly, brought 37 lawsuits from March through November, right? Um, you expanded the vote in many, many jurisdictions, but walk them through a little bit what you can do, what tools do you have available to you, Sophia, for, um, for protecting the right to vote against suppressive uh, policies and regulations? Well, we follow these bills from you know, inception to possible passage, and we use every possible tool in our toolkit from um, asking all of you to sign up to, for people power to help us in our efforts to um, lobby legislators to provide them with information about the effects of some of these bills um, to try to make the bills better to use yeah. some of these back end channels that Andrea mentioned to um, create better processes. And, um, you know, if all else fails, making sure that we have a record in the legislature that um, we know that this is all about suppressing the right to vote, especially black and brown voters rights as well, um, to set the stage for an eventual court case. Yeah. So give, it, give one example of a suppressive policy or rule that people are trying to push through now. So just people can visualize it. What does voter suppression look like? What, is it what form does it take right now? What are they trying to do? So obviously ranges from every single step of the process, but 
you know, some of the common ones that you'll often hear about, especially right now, are um, more cumbersome voter identification requirements, right. Right. for example, including during the process of voting by mail, which... Why does that matter? I mean, my, my, my mother always used to say to me, well, why does it matter if they ask for a driver's license? She's got one. She had one. She's no longer alive. But, and I had to explain to her why it was onerous for folks. But walk us through it with like the, the ID requirements. Yes, well, for, so for many people, getting an ID with a photo that's up to date, that has all the information that it needs to have about where you live currently, your proper name, your full name, if you change your name, all of these kinds of efforts requires underlying documentation. So do you need a birth certificate, a social security card, all of these kinds of things. And even if you have those items, even finding a DMV or a government agency to go to, especially right now yeah. during COVID yeah. is, can be quite a barrier for many, yeah. many individuals. Yeah, plus an updated, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, the photograph I have in my wallet that has a address that's two addresses ago and has a very useful picture of me that's almost 12 years or 30, and I'm not about to change it. I love the, I love the way I look at that. <laughs> I had more hair than I have now. So it's just not, it's not so easy to just say you want an updated um, uh, photo requirement. Andrea, talk to me about what we have been trying. As part of the systemic equality agenda, we're going to be adding resources around redistricting, mm -hmm. right, which I want to come back to you and ask you about, Sophia, and to be able to bring the litigation we'll, we're going to need to do to fight these suppressive voter tactics. So we're going to build the policy work with Ronnie. We're going to build the the legal work with Sophia and other folks. But we're also gonna build really intensively with a lot of intentionality in the South. Talk to us about why that's important, Andrea, and remind people where you're sitting. Sure, well, you know, one of the great things we were able to, to sort of pilot this year was the Southern affiliates working together because what we because white supremacy is so much a theme and a, organizing principle of many of these anti-democratic measures that we see, um, they tend to sort of go across the South like a tornado. So the abortion bans, for example, sort of swept across the South. We, the voter restrictions will sweep us across the South. So we want to work collectively and be able to stop these things when they are starting and really mount, um, you know, mount the, 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 the offensive um, to sort of stop them, you know, in the South before they spread, you know, to the rest of the country, but also because, you know, this is where so many black and brown people are, and live, we are being right? held hostage. A majority of black Americans, according to the last annual census, live in the South. And we are being held hostage to these very extreme, very racialist policies um, that deny health care, that deny reproductive rights, that deny access to easy access to the ballot, that deny the re, you know quality educational resources, you know, and, and so you know we're still you know as we heard about the third reconstruction. I mean, we are yeah. still living as second class citizens, you know, uh, in our in, in our own country uh, because of these very these policies that are so driven by racial animus and by white supremacy. And I think the one thing I would add in addition to all this is that it's especially come home to me in the COVID moment. I have been stuck at the same spot mm -hmm. since last March, right? In my dining room table here in New York state. And yet there have been so many controversies that have played out across the country, including in your state, Andrea. And the reason why the ACLU can be effective yeah. is because the ACLU director is not just in New York. The ACLU director is in Atlanta, and it's in and and she's in Kentucky, mm -hmm. and she's in Louisiana, yeah. and she's in Alabama, and so we are the only national group yeah. with paid staff in each and every single state. All in, we have about 165 full-time employees in the Southern affiliates, combined budgets of around 26.9. Mm -hmm. And part of what we're planning to do, you know this well, because you've been twisting my arm, not, you know, not too hard because I've been letting you twist my arm, is that we're going to put much more money into these Southern offices to really put them on a round of growth hormones. And I think ultimately, I mean, this, this I will give you 
every single, all the credit. When you first called me up after the election and said, mm -hmm. now we've got to focus on the runoff races, mm -hmm. because what happens in Georgia with these runoff races will change the national map. And that is also part of the reason why you work on the South, because if you can kind of work and deepen a commitment for civil liberties and civil rights in the South, yeah. you can change the national political calculus. Yeah. Um, Sophia, talk to me about redistricting, right? It, 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 I, it, I'm a lawyer. I play one on TV and I pay my bar license fees, but I don't really understand. Walk me through the what, why redistricting really matters. You get the census and then what? What goes from there and why is it an opportunity for expanding political power for people of color communities? Sure. So the policies that we care about um, that Andrea mentioned, those flow from the people that we elect and who we elect depends to a large degree on these political maps um, that are drawn to determine which voters vote for whom. And so every 10 years, and this is one of those years, um, there is this redistricting process. It's where, all up for grabs, right? Potentially, right. <laughs> potentially. Um, and you know, states do redraw the district lines based on population data gathered in that census. And you know, if it's done right and, and truly things are up for grabs, um, those maps are going to reflect population changes, population growth, as well as racial diversity and, and ensure that the districts actually reflect the voices, choices and right. not the other way around. Now, the problem that we have is that too often the states are using this redistricting process as a political tool. Yep. And so legislators are drawing the lines that determine- To protect themselves, right? Who their voters are. It's and like so the, they fox, can draw, the fox building the chicken coop, literally, right? Unfortunately, unfortunately. Yep. And the result is, you know, what we've seen time and time again, since this redistricting process after redistricting process, yeah. which is gerrymandered lines, which is essentially where you're diluting or minimizing the voices of certain voters. Yeah. And yeah. of course, those tend to be black and brown voters. And yeah. See, Lachlan McDonald, who was one of, who was your predecessor, um, one of the great voting rights litigators of the ACLU, started the organization back in the 60s, he explained it to me like this at one time at Early House. He says, they crack minority power, which means like if you take a community of black folk, you can crack it and put half the community in one district and half in another district and therefore diminish their power. You can stack them, right? Which is just, you basically create this little corridor or of power where you just kind of try to kind of insulate them like, you know, like um, a particular community uh, or you pack them, which you over concentrate them so that you have a, a district that has 98% black or Latino voters. Whereas if you had two districts, that was one that was 60%, where you could have the minority community be able to elect its, its official choice, and then still have 30% in another district where you have real, real juice and real power, you could have real influence. So that's, that's how I understood it. Help me understand also the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, you know, which I think we're gonna get to um, also, as we talk about the legislative agenda in the next section, but what, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about John Lewis was in your neck of the woods, right, Andrea? Oh, yeah. Well, John, John Lewis uh, occupied my dad's uh, congressional seat. And, um, and now we have a one. Tell, tell them who your dad uh, is. You're your own woman in your own sure. right, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So uh, Andrew Young uh, was the first uh, African-American elected from the Deep South since yeah. Reconstruction. Uh, yeah. and, and, I, and that's always important to me because since Reconstruction, right? Yeah. And so we have Amazing. achieved these goals and been pushed back. And that's, all, that's the concern is that we make progress, but they, but they change the laws. They, they, they maneuver to try to, again, uh, undermine the power and the ability of African-Americans to elect the leaders that they cho choose. Uh, and that's why the Voting Rights Act was so important and preclearance is so important. It's the difference between an administrative remedy and a three to four year lawsuit. And Sophia, what is preclearance and why did, how did we lose preclearance? 
Sure, preclearance was the very critical feature of the Voting Rights Act, Landmark Voting Rights Act that really made it so effective. And it was a process by which certain jurisdictions, the worst violators, racist uh, violators in terms of voting were required to ask for permission to change their voting laws. And that those voting laws, uh, permission from the federal government um, would only go into effect if the federal government determined that it would not have a detrimental effect to voters of color. And so um, a number of the Southern states as well as other jurisdictions across the country were covered by this provision and therefore had to ask for permission to make these even small yeah. changes like changing a polling place yeah. can have a huge effect. And in 2013, the Supreme Court in a case Shelby County v. Holder essentially yeah. gutted that provision yeah. um, and it's no longer in effect. And that's opened a wave of uh, voter suppression um, in, in the formerly covered jurisdictions. That's really great context. Andrea, before I let you go, um, I'm always so happy to see you and to hear from you. I, there was, I was reading uh, something that you had written about Equality has been a dream turned a mirage, if I remember that correctly. Some, can you help me kind of figure out why you think the systemic equality agenda is just so important for the ACLU, for Georgia, for you, for your family's legacy? Yeah. You, you know, know the, wrap it up for us the, so that we can six, kind of yeah, switch gears. The 1619 Project actually got me thinking about my own family's journey in America. Five, five generations in slavery. Uh, five generations in uh, Jim Crow. Um, and so always working, always pressing, but it seems that it's always over the horizon, um, the real opportunity to be full citizens and, uh, you know, country we've been in for 10, 10 generations. And so people have got to see the results that democracy yeah. will work for them. I'm inspired by it. Okay, let me switch gears. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Andrea. Let me call up to the stage two of my colleagues who are also the key protagonists behind our policy and legal work on the systemic equality agenda. Renika Moore, the director of the Racial Justice Program, and Rakeem Brooks, the campaign strategist in our National Political Advocacy Department. Hello, my friends. Hello. Thank you. Hello. So this is your brainchild. I mean, you have been coming up with all these ideas on <laughs> what we can do to make a difference on racial justice and systemic equality. Talk to me. I guess I'll start off with, uh, let me start off with Renika right first, if I don't mind. I'm going to just talk to me a little bit about the work you do at the Racial Justice Program and give us a deeper dive into the intersection issues between student debt, racial justice, civil liberties, like why are we even talking about student loans as a racial justice issue? I think in terms of why student debt is, is critically important to the ACLU and to the systemic equality agenda, I think we need to think about the fact, I'm gonna talk about some of the reasons why um, black families um, generally are overburdened with debt um, across the board, but in particular student debt, right? So. We know that Black families um, hold less household wealth as well as generational wealth. And so Andrea was just talking about her family story, you know, and I think about my family story and, and you know, my grandparents um, managed to buy their own home and lost it during the 2008 recession um, as a part of um, uh, a predatory loan, they not understanding um, and years they spent building up equity. And that's the story of many black families um, in this country. And so we know historically that black families have had difficulty accruing debt because of policies like redlining, um, policies like um, we think about major government programs that excluded black Americans. Um, I'll give one example um, when we talk about, for instance, the GI Bill, right? That was supposed to, that was one of the major drivers to create a, an American middle class um, for veterans coming home from the war. And we saw, um, we saw that 1.2 million black veterans came back. And yet we saw in New York and New Jersey, as there were over 37,000 loans provided, only 100 were given to non-white borrowers. So you saw huge disparities in what was given at the same time in Mississippi. There were over 3,700 home loans given and only two 
too, in Mississippi were given to black families. Right. Um, and it's the legacy of those kind of government programs, that kind of access um, that's led to huge uh, disparities in terms of the wealth um, that, that families have to draw on if you're yeah. black versus white. Um, and so I think, you know, we see even in present day, just before COVID, yeah. white families have more than 10 times the household wealth of black families have a, about $171,000 on average as yeah. compared to 17000 for black families. Um, yeah. And we know that since COVID, we've seen huge losses of wealth, um, vast unemployment, particularly hitting black women. Um, yeah. And so we know that those numbers are only worse. Um, and so those are some of the drivers of the wealth disparity that then create huge burdens for uh, black people trying to go to school and trying yeah. to trying to get an education. Yeah. Um, right. Rakeem, talk to me about what people are going to be able to do to plug into the systemic equality agenda. You have been the kind of the mastermind taking through with Renika. Um, what are we going to do around student debt, postal bank? Postal banking for communities of color. What are people actually going to be able to do to operationalize a concern for this set of issues? So just like you said, when you kicked us off, uh, they're going to be able to join People Power and learn more about systemic equality. We're going to have seven sessions. And in the first session, we're going to go over what systemic racism is and why systemic equality is the solution. To just underscore what you and Renika were just talking about. You know, Black borrowers pay more for the American dream. That's really the heart of the problem but we're gonna unpack that and explain it to our members and to our people power volunteers. But not only that, we're going to equip them with skills to help us move these campaigns forward. As you were discussing with Andrea, when I go into coalition meetings now on these particular issues, student debt, postal banking, the child tax credit, the thing that I hear the most from our coalition partners yeah. is that we can do battle everywhere as the ACLU. They are so excited yeah. to work with us because we have this huge membership that is active, that is engaged, that is educated about the issues. And this action series that we're gonna run for systemic equality is all about building on that. It's about drawing out the resources of our members to achieve something. Yeah. Uh, and I just couldn't be more excited about it. That's great. Renika, you wanna queue up the, the video from our young ACU supporter? You wanna talk sure. to us a little bit about it? Sure, exactly. So we're going to hear from a student. Uh, she's an ACLU supporter. Her name is Ayana McCarley, um, and she is going to talk about what student debt, um, the burden is placed on her family, um, and what she what she thinks she can do um, to support people power and to support the ACLU to address kind of these the systemic inequalities that uh, that we're trying to challenge in this agenda. Hello, my name is Ayanna McCarley and I'm an undergraduate student at NYU studying social psychology and Africana studies. My family and I had to take out student loans for all four years of college because I received no financial aid and no scholarships. Schools often said that I didn't qualify for any money because on paper, my family looks like we have enough to pay for my education, but in actuality, we don't. Sometimes I even feel guilty for choosing to pursue an education at my school because of the loans my family and I had to take out. It made me question if my education was even worth it, that much money and whether I'd ever be able to pay all this money back and still invest in my future. This country has monetized higher education and restricted who can receive one. And at the same time, I know going to college is a critical gateway to getting a job and achieving a livable wage but the student debt crisis has become a barrier to achieving financial stability, especially for Black and Latinx borrowers who already face so many other systemic obstacles to building wealth. For these reasons, I pledge to support this student debt cancellation campaign. Canceling student debt is a critical step to help close the racial wealth gap and ensure everyone has an opportunity to achieve financial stability. I ask that you consider joining this fight and signing up for ACLU People Power. Their strength in numbers and together, we can make it so myself and so many others aren't standing so far behind the starting line. <laughs> oh my God, where'd you find her? She'll find me 10 more of her. <laughs> Rakeem, what is the solution here for Ayana and for other folks like that? I mean, who are really kind of buckling under the pressure of student debt. What's, what, what are we asking for? I was gonna say the point, um, a point to make is that there's nothing Ayana can do alone. 
right? Ultimately, it's about all of us coming together to push the Biden administration and this Congress to forgive $50,000 worth of student debt per student loan borrower. The reason that's so crucial is it might surprise people to know, Renika pointed to the wealth gap stats that have only gotten worse through COVID. Yeah. Uh, there are various estimates, but at the most conservative end, we could uh, remove, reduce um, the student, excuse me, reduce the racial wealth gap by 25% just by dealing with the student debt crisis because black borrowers are so indebted relative to everyone else in the society. Um, one thing I like to point out is that for the same degree, there have been numerous studies done, a white student pays $1, a black student pays $1.50. Four years after graduation, the black student has paid $2 for that. And 20 years after they've graduated, uh, white families have paid off roughly 94% of their student loan debt. Black families still, uh, still owe 95% of their student loan debt. That's 20 years after they've graduated from college. And so the depth of this crisis is nothing that one person can get from under just by hard work and ingenuity, unless you get really lucky and invest in Bitcoin, apparently. But other than that, it's really the case that we require federal legislation uh, to remove what is a fundamentally systemically racist system. And I think I think it's a I think it's incumbent upon the government to kind of ease the debt on on students and their families. Um, and President Biden is committed to doing at least ten thousand, but he's got to go further. Five times far, far, farther, right? Ten thousand dollars would actually exacerbate the wealth gap. Why? It ends up exacerbating the wealth gap because uh, the vast concentration of small dollar loans. So if white borrowers are taking out less to begin with, it will disproportionately benefit white borrowers of which there are more in the country. And so it'll exacerbate the wealth gap. We celebrate people like Robert Smith, who just kind of made this huge commitment, I guess, to Morehouse, where he said that the uh, graduating class would graduate uh, debt free. Debt free. That's what we should be asking for from our federal government. Okay. So what else can people do in terms of people power? What do they do to kind of Walk it through them. I, I mean, I, I, I've been on, I've been on the platform. I've been on the People Power trainings. But for folks who are brand new to us, we're keen. Walk them through what they can do. Sure. So you're going to sign up for People Power, and our organizing activists are going to be in touch with you to let you know about the sessions. The first session, as I said, will be an introduction to systemic racism and systemic, systemic equality. We'll subsequently have a session on voting rights, carrying right. on the um, discussion that Andrea was having earlier and then a session on student debt. But in each of those sessions, if you imagine it, we're gonna have guest speakers take the student debt one. One of my favorite scholars, Tom Shapiro has agreed to appear. He wrote a, call, a book that I recommend to everybody, The Hidden Cost of Being African-American. So he's gonna come really lay it out for our audiences. And then our activists are gonna talk about a particular action. that's gonna be something that I designed, but I won't preview it here. Okay, a particular okay. action that we'd like them to take in order to move the needle. And this is so, a year long campaign. We're trying to get this done as soon as possible. So they'll participate in that. And then I will regularly be in communication with those who take the action to take subsequent actions throughout the year. So I have one more question for Renika, but before I let you go, Rakeem, because I know we're over time, but the hell with it. My folks, our folks will stick with us because this is a good program. You have convinced me that the post office can play a role that it has, it, it, it is capable of playing, but is not playing currently in underbanked and under asseted communities. Walk people through it. Give okay. them a teaser so they can learn more about the post office as a banking institution in black and uh, people of color communities. Sure, let's do it quickly. So the post office quickly, yeah. used to have savings accounts, low income, for low cost savings accounts. It got rid of them in the 60s when there was the promise of so much giving uh, Lyndon Johnson's great society legislation. Yeah. Today, roughly half of black communities are unbanked or underbanked and paying usurious fees for things like check cashing, like um, um, money transfers and so forth. Post offices already have the authority, uh, according to the inspector general in 2014 and 2015 report, to provide all of those services, such as they would save those families $2,000 a year on average and for the median black family, $80,000 over the course of their lifetime, which is equivalent to two years of their income. And so this is a public option that we can provide. As you know, the ACLU won a campaign recently in Nebraska to cap interest rates. This yeah. is the flip side of that, as opposed to going after the usurious, uh, you know, payday loan folks, we're yeah. actually going to attempt to provide a public And it option. doesn't require legislation because it's already no, an enabling statute. it doesn't statute. require legislation. What we have to do first is we have, uh, we're going to pressure the Biden administration to appoint new 
persons to the, um, excuse me, new governors to the Postal Board of Governors. Yeah, yeah, and from yeah, there, yeah. we can move towards this. And and what I love about this is that everyone was making the post office their their favorite poster child when it was talking about the election, you know, and, the, and it had the kind of Trump's postmaster general, the billionaire who came to kind of deliver the mail, who was kind of trying to pull out the sorting machines and everyone got all worked up and all in a tizzy over the post office. Well, now we can kind of really show our love for the post office if we build out the capacity. Renika Moore, let me ask you a question and a final question for you. So I've been getting a lot of pushback about well, where is criminal justice? And I purposely have wanted an agenda focus on racial justice and systemic equality to be bigger than criminal justice because the ACLU has historically been very much involved in criminal justice. Miranda was our case, Gideon was our case, you know, driving while black and brown, kind of stop and frisk. But give me a minute or two about where is the criminal justice and policing issues as it relates to this broader systemic equality agenda and how it sits either alongside of it or complements it. Sure. I mean, I think it's absolutely complimentary. As you talked about, the ACLU has a longstanding commitment to criminal justice issues, and that work is continuing, um, and that some of that work is a part of the systemic equality agenda. But the systemic equality agenda endeavors to move us farther and is looking to take on issues that the ACLU hasn't historically taken on, like Rakeem was talking about. And so part of the systemic equality agenda is addressing some of the barriers created by arrest and conviction records and the legacy of contact with the criminal justice system. Um, and so what we see, what we're doing here with the systemic equality agenda is really expanding on and complementing the historical work that the ACLU has done around criminal justice. Yeah. And so I we, we should see this as more. Not I, rem I remember some of the criticism I got years ago when I first created the criminal justice, the campaign for smart justice campaign. I got criticized saying, well, you know, not all black and brown people are criminals. So what are you doing on racial justice generally? I'm like, I understand. But one of the greatest civil rights issues in black and brown communities is the criminal justice system. So now we're trying to kind of put another ballast in the bottom of the ship and kind of really rebuild the non-criminal law related work of our racial justice program. Thank you for the That's two of you. Right. you two, two of you are amazing. I would follow you to hell and back. You know, you guys are the <laughs> best. I really do appreciate the two of you. Okay, let me close out before um, we close. We have a special, we have this special te tease of a video from a celebrity who's going to come say something to you. But let me just say one thing before I turn it over to him. Um, I have an amazing group of people. I have a hard job, but my job is really very easy if I have colleagues like this. And you've just seen, you know, uh, Deborah Archer and Ronnie Newman and Sophia Lark Larkin and Andrea Young and Rakeem Brooks and Renika Moore. And you can see the type of caliber and talent that the ACLU is able to both attract and then support and then unleash to do good in the world. And Whenever you get bummed out about what's going on in the world, I want you to think about what the world would look like if we didn't exist, right? And in the moment when we weren't sure what had the outcome of the election, I had to give a kind of like a pep talk to my troops who were really kind of dispirited on the kind of the Tuesday night when it's just no one knew what the hell was going on. And I said, I just need you to focus on what this would be like, what America would be like if the ACLU had not been fighting Donald Trump and his administration for the last four years. But for us, what would this democracy in this country look like? And then I want you to all feel good about what you've done too, because but for your help, we could not do the work we do. Because but for your help, it would be a great, be a lot of good aspirations and goals and talented people working in less meaningful and impactful jobs. I really want to thank you very much. Hello, ACLU supporters. It's me, one of your own, W. Kamau Bell, the ACLU's Artist Ambassador for Racial Justice. I wanted to share my support for the ACLU Systemic Equality Agenda. We got work to do, and we all know that these are forever problems which require forever solutions. Look, the last four years have been a wild ride, and I have personally been inspired seeing how the ACLU and supporters like you have fought the Trump administration's endless parade of discriminatory and racist policies. And I 
I'm actually looking forward to how we can dig deeper now that he's gone to get to the root of our white supremacist origins. We all know it's hard work, but of course it's also hard to ignore work. And look, I live here in Oakland, so I know what I'm talking about. I have seen activists and organizers work on things like defund the police for years before it was a national conversation. And I've seen the activists and organizers here in Oakland accomplish things like getting the police out of the Oakland public schools. So if Oakland can do it, the whole country can do it. And so I'm confident in you, confident in me, but I'm confident in me because of you and us together, we the people, we can right these wrongs. So together, let's learn more. What is the current problem with our systems? How do we get here? How can we rebuild systems based around equity, accessibility, and equality? And what can we do to make real change happen? I encourage you to join me and sign up for People Power to find out how. All right. Hopefully that will have been worth. I'm sorry it took 12 minutes more of your time than I promised, but it's a lot of ground to cover and I hopefully will leave you at the end of this hour and 12 minutes with a lot more energy and enthusiasm and hope and a sincere thanks. And we'll see you on the other side. Be safe. Know that we care and that we're counting upon you for the long haul. So take good care. Okay. We'll sign off.